welcome. Thank you so much for coming tonight. To uh, we're, we're talking about trees and it's a very passionate topic because there's people that love trees and people that hate trees. And trees on verges are even more of a hot potato. So we're going to go through a few things um, today, tonight. And um, I'm a, a self-confessed tree hugger. I've always loved trees and loved forests. Um, I'm, my name is Sabrina Hahn. I've been a horticulturalist for many, many years, since about the Jurassic period, I reckon. And I have lived in the city of Melville for 27 years. So, um, so I know the area quite well, understand the soil type, and know lots of the street trees that are around here. So tonight's talk is really about succession planning for trees. Because the thing we don't think about is that trees have an age limit. Some trees get diseases, some trees are, um, will get attacked by insects which affects how they live and other trees have a long, short, uh, a short lifespan or a long lifespan. So when a tree starts failing, then we have to look at why it's failing, whether we can do anything about it and what we should replace it with. But the thing to bear in mind is that if we put all our trees in, say in, in 1965 we do a mass planting, then all those trees will die together 70 years down the track. And that's what's happening now with many of the street trees is that they're old and they've got diseases and they're just, and they're failing. So it's important for us to do planting at different intervals. So we don't have, and that's what happened with Melbourne when they got the disease and the beetle in some of their older trees, they basically all died at once. So we need to think about how we actually do that planting and stage it so that we've got young trees, we've got middle-aged trees and we've got old trees. So they're all coming on at different times. So I guess the thing that we don't do anymore is observe because everyone is so busy these days. We have forgotten to observe nature. We look at a verge tree because it sticks out because there's usually nothing else around it. So that becomes a focal point. Now there are some people that hate trees. They hate the fact that it obscures their view, that it drops leaves, that it has flowers, that it attracts bees. So, and the council will get complaints from people saying, you need to take this tree out. There's certain trees that people hate. Box trees is a great example and I'm actually with that crew. <laughs> um, and cocos palms just should never be planted anywhere. Um, so there's people that love and hate, some people hate jacaranda trees because they drop leaves and then they drop flowers. So it's a very emotional sort of a topic to talk about. And then everyone will want a different type of tree. So when we have avenue planting, people will go, I want an avenue of jacarandas. And then there'll be people that say, that's rubbish. Let's put in native trees. We should only have native trees. So the argument will go backwards and forwards. And in between all this, the council then have to mediate and make the right choice for the right tree in the right place. And that's no easy, <laughs> that's no easy task when you've got people that are very passionate on one side or another. We're looking at a changing climate. Whether you think that it's from aliens that are here or it's a natural phenomena or we have created it, whatever, whatever you think climate change is about, the fact is our climate is definitely changing. We have lower rainfall, we know that. We have warmer winters. We're having extended summers. The insects know that because they are breeding. They've got extra life cycles. We're getting insects that we haven't had before. 
We're getting diseases that are more prevalent now because conditions are right for them, particularly fungal and bacterial diseases. So there's some things that we really, if, if we stop and observe it, we will see that that is occurring. When we're looking at tree selection, there's a lot of things to think about. So it's, it's not just the species, it's about the timing of planting. Traditionally, um, I think councils and certainly in uh, developers would put trees in 100 litre bags because they make a statement and you've actually got a tree that you can see. We now know that the money is better spent to buy more trees in smaller pots so they adapt and adjust to the climate better. So if you're putting in a 100 litre bag tree, you've got the equipment that you need to actually make the hole for that tree, you've got a high ab that you need to lower it off the truck to put in the tree, your watering regime will be twice as much and the prep for the hole will be twice as much. So many trees thrive much better if they're in a 35 to 40 litre pot and then their root system finds out where it will go. Timing of planting, we have to be aware that the climate is changing. So traditionally planting would be done May, June, July, but now if we can get a water truck to them, we can actually extend that period of planting. And that's all about um, observing what's going on and taking our cues from nature rather than just from a schedule. Soil prep, vitally important. As you, who here are gardeners? Most of you, you're all very good people. I can tell already. <laughs> so you understand that soil is everything. The most important thing about anything that we do on the planet is soil. It's like the skin on our body, we don't think about it. It's just there. Soil is the same, it's just there. We can't see what's happening in it. But it is an absolute microcosm of activity. So when we're planting trees now, we have to take notice of what the soil type is. So if you're right down near the river, then you have to take into account there will be the salt winds that come off the water. The soil type will be extremely sandy. <laughs> we, have, we live in a sand pit really. Um, and the pH is probably quite likely to be high. But the influence of the salt will mean that we have to think very carefully about what species will do best, particularly on the river. I'll talk a bit about pest and disease issues a bit later. The other thing that's happening is on all around the city of Melville, most of the verges are quite wide. Now that we've got infill, urban infill and block development, the verges are becoming smaller. So that means we have to look at what we can accommodate on that verge. So the greatest loss of canopy cover at the moment is from urban infill. So I live in Willoughby. They are all between 690 and 1,000 square metre blocks and they're all being subdivided. The first thing that happens is every single living green thing gets bulldozed down. Gone. Not a single stick left. Not a tree, not a leaf, nothing. And they mow it flat so it looks as picturesque and beautiful sand pit. <laughs> Now, in these suburbs, most of those trees in people's backyards are 65 years old. So you're looking at a whole collection and the canopy cover of 65-year-old trees gone. <coughs> Nothing left. So that means the verges are so much more important now because that is going to be the only canopy we get in our suburbs. Urban infill will continue. Thankfully, the um, state government have just re released a new set of legislation 
which covers apartments and flats and buildings. So now developers can't do that. So now there will be setbacks. Now there will have to be space left for trees. Now there will have to be space that includes green space. So that came out on the 28th, on the 18th of February and it's enforced uh, next March. So developers will be bulldozing everything down they possibly can over that period of time, I feel sure. Um, but I've looked at some overhead uh, um, images of particularly where I am in Willoughby, and it's 160 trees have gone down just in my neighbourhood. 163. That's a lot of canopy cover. One of the big things that the City of Melville is really interested in doing is actually increasing the biodiversity. So when you look 65 years ago or even 30 years ago, the selection of trees that we had was much narrower than what we've got now. Now we have tree nurseries who are actually servicing local council and saying, what are you looking for? What size do you want? So the diversity of tree species we can use now is so much greater which means that we can increase the biodiversity of our suburbs, of our neighbourhoods with those street trees because we can use different trees if we're going to have an avenue of trees. The main thing about trees is it has to give more than just one thing. It has to give more than just shade. It has to be there for all the other organisms which live or did live in our suburbs. We want to encourage that because if there's a balance of birds and insects, then you probably won't get as many of the disease and pest issues that we have now. There's a, um, a, a bug in the plane trees and there are literally millions of them. They've come from Europe and what they do is they scarify the leaf, they suck all the sap out, they mine, it's like a leaf miner, um, goes through the leaf. One female can lay 250 eggs and she can have quite a few cycles. So what's happening now with the plane trees is they're defoliating in summer as well as winter. So that's creating enormous stress on the trees and will have an adverse effect on their long-term health. And there's nothing that we have that can treat those bugs, nothing. It's, it's another thing about the whole avenue of trees to individual trees, how many different species. Do you give people a choice of the tree that they would like on their verge? And that's a good thing because then people feel they have an input and they have a sense of ownership and they might help look after that tree where, they, where it doesn't just rely on a contractor coming along with a water truck to water it. We need to look at impervious paving. So the city of Melville had a major problem with flooding because there's so much hard surface, nowhere for it to go, so it builds up on the road and you get flooding on the road. If we use paving that allows the water to seep through, then of course it waters everything around it. And there's lots of that. A lot of cities are doing that now. They're using paving that's actually, that absorbs, allows the water to come through. The other thing we need to talk about is if the council do all this tree planting and they put in more than one tree per verge, which is what I'm recommending, um, will ratepayers actually chip in a couple of extra dollars a year in their rates to have those trees maintained over a longer period of time and that's a big thing. So whenever rates are increased people want to know exactly where their money is going. So do we value green space and trees enough to actually say we will contribute an extra five dollars a year so that those trees can be maintained and looked after for longer than just the first 
one or two years. Because the maintenance budget for the parks and gardens is very tight. So, so it, the money is going to have to come from somewhere. So we need to express that to local council to say, we value green space. We value these verge trees. But that will only happen if the general public gets their input and saying this is what they are looking for. So that's just a really brief what we're going to talk about tonight. But what I want tonight to be is to be fully interactive. So I want, I want you, everyone here, to express their ideas on what, what they see as being valuable, what they think would be a really good idea, what, what they see has not worked, doesn't work, and maybe we can explain why that doesn't work. Because we do have, we've got, they're, they're at the back, We've, we've got people from the city of Melville here tonight and I'm sure um, if they're not under attack they'd be very, very happy to answer any, any of your questions. So I don't actually work for the city of Melville, I'm just, I'm do, I just like talking about trees really. Oh. Um, so that our, um, our birds have something to eat. Better put another R in there. Uh, yes, well, people call lots of different things red gums, um, but the Marys get the canker. Yeah, and they're the yes. ones with the gum nuts. The big, the big nuts, yeah, the big honky nuts. Yep, now I'm a Banksia lover, and I have to say, they're bloody unreliable. Yep. Like yeah. Yeah. Oh, the, the other thing about Banksy is, is oh, they're a live fast, die young. They do. So, um, so that's a good thing, though, with succession planting. Oh, they last for twenty years. Yeah, twenty years. No, no, they've been longer than that. They don't in my place. <laughs> Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So um, deciduous trees. So these are these are all native, and of course there's always a place for deciduous. Are there any deciduous native? The only deciduous native plant is Tuna australis and the Cape lilac tree. They are the only two deciduous trees. Well, the botanists have been fighting about this for the last hundred years, and um, so the last the last research paper I read, they've said yes, it is. It's native to Australia. Oh, it doesn't matter. Kids spit out poisonous stuff. <laughs> They're not as poisonous as they, yeah, that's right. They're not as poisonous as, and the cockatoos love them. And the poor bastards have got, oh, no swearing, have got nothing else to eat. So they're going, I think the Cape lilac is the most beautiful tree. But it gets that black beetle. The caterpillar. I know it gets the caterpillar, but we need to just build up, nothing really eats the caterpillars. <laughs> But we, you can do banding and, and God, the parks and wild, the park, park guys would love to do banding around those trees, wouldn't they? So the sizing of the tree. Now most of the labels for trees are made in Victoria and it is, or, or in Queensland. So if you've got a Queensland rainforest tree and they say it gets to 40 metres, it's never ever going to do that here when you've got claret ashes and the, and the ornamental pears, the same thing, they will not get as big as what they get in Victoria because of our soil type, because of our rainfall. So, um, so it's, Hospital. so the Aretha Cori's and the Silver Princess are now being used in medium strips, but neither of them are actually a canopy tree. 
Does anyone know the Melaleuca viridiflora? Which is a native West Australian. Most of the Melaleucas, oh, the, you, you, <laughs> of course you do. Most of the Melaleucas that are planted are Eastern States Melaleucas, but our Melaleucas are sensational. Melaleuca viridiflora has beautiful red bottle brush flowers. It flowers twice a year, sometimes three times a year. Tough as old boots. The beautiful paper bark, great tree, gets to eight metres and about six metres wide. The New Holland honey eaters nest in mine every year. Then there's Melaleuca argentia, which is a beautiful weeping Melaleuca from up north. Does very well in our, in our sands. Hakea, yep. So the hakeas, um, especially hakea lorina. The black cockatoos love hakea, yep. She oaks, yep, as long as you don't want anything else growing around it but she oaks because they, they poison, they gas, they actually gas everything around them, which is very clever, so that they don't get... Um, any competition? Of course. Okay, so uh, you know how I was talking about soil prep? Yep. One of the things we know now is that uh, there's various bacteria and fungi that actually helps trees fight fungi. So there's soil microbes you can buy in a bucket now. I can, I can tell you the names of things because I'm not on ABC. So it's called Grow Safe Soil Microbes. You buy it in a bucket, you don't have to dig it in, you sprinkle it around all everything, you water it in and it attaches itself, any plant, but it's really good for native plants. So if you've got a Carimbia in and you're worried about canker, then I would definitely get some of those around. And I could put it around my Maori trees as well? Every, every tree, every plant, in fact, because the microbes attach themselves to the roots of the plants. And that's what I've done with my neighbour's tree because the Carimbia across the road is now three quarters dead and I don't want hers to die because it's probably about, it'd be 65 years old and it's magnificent. It, has, it hasn't shown any signs of canker at all. Now let's talk about fruit trees a little. Um, so macadamia. Now, in Queensland they use macadamia as street trees and they're magnificent. They look sensational. I think one of the things is people are worried that it's a trip hazard. No, that because they're, they're, you know. So I reckon the cockies would knock them off though. Yeah, they do. Now, one of the complaints from some groups of people when I mentioned putting street trees in, um, fruit trees is a street tree, they say that it breeds fruit fly and the fruit will drop on the ground and rot. There is no way a piece of fruit or a nut would ever touch the ground. Um, <laughs> it would never get that far down. Between kids and birds, you don't have to worry about fruit falling on the ground. Fruit fly, I guess, though, is a thing. So, um, mulberries are fantastic. Yeah. You would have all the neighbourhood kids up in that tree going home with red stain yeah. all, <laughs> over the, all over their school clothes. Oh, I don't know. I think it's great. I love big, messy trees. <laughs> yeah, now, they are beautiful. And you know what? They would do really, really well. The ornamental pistachio tree. They are a beautiful canopy. And the, the colours when they were in autumn are beautiful. And they're as tough as old boots, the ornamental pistachio. So you don't get no, there's no nuts. No. What about avocados? They're big, but 
Avocado. Yeah. yeah, they're a nice big... Mm, the only problem is this street tree. You, you'd have to put it where someone's going to water it. Oh, okay. Because they require a lot of water. Do they? Yeah. What about Whereas Carob is a beautiful street tree. So, so with the carob, they get to they'll get a twenty meter spread. So they are magnificent canopy tree. And then, of course, if you've got the female tree, you get the carob, the carob beans. She is a little bit smelly, I have to say, when she's in flower, but it's quite worth it. Yep. I mean, that's where, like I said, if I'm going to put one in my front yard, you can jam all them. I've got yep. to put an olive in it. And yep. a fruit tree, you can put a lime yep. or an orange or a lemon. Yep. Something that gives yeah. something to... Tree, but kids want to eat it. Good option. And, you know, from a, from a, a sort of a sociological bent on it, if you've got, like, Willoughby it used to be a, a really poor area. It's in low socio-demographic. Um, well, yeah, I think they've all gone now, the wharfies. I haven't seen any wharfies. She used to hear marvellous fights and things <laughs> at <laughs> night. <laughs> when the Willoughby pub was up yeah. on the top of the road there. Um, but in, in these areas, if you've got fruit trees, then kids that don't get to have fresh fruit and stuff, I mean, it's all there. There's a park in Palmyra, and they, it used to have a house on it, and they demolished the house, and it's, they kept, they left, the council look after it, they left all the fruit trees, and it is so wonderful. You can go to that park at any time of the year, and all you see is a big mob of kids in all the fruit trees. Yeah. It's fantastic. Um, I don't think the, you'd need too much water, but the almond, the ice cream, does anyone know the ice cream bean tree? Um, it's, so it actually has a long pod and when you open it up, all the, the stuff on the inside is like, it's like ice cream, but it does require a lot of water to get, to get the beans, but the kids, Kids would love it. Well, they are actually a declared weed now in Queensland, Northern New South Wales and the Northern Territory. So, Now, native frangipani, that's interesting. The street that I live in, there's kind of a hodgepodge of all different things on the street verge, particularly out the front of my place because I planted all the trees out in my front verge. Uh, that's many years ago now. Um, <laughs> They've got native frangipanis there and they're all, they've all got really major, major problems with aphids and they're covered in sooty mould and they're failing. They're looking, they look terrible. Oh, they were just dying of old age. No. Well, they're probably dying of old age as well because they would have been planted a long time ago. But normally... Um, in Hoiti Toiti, um, Claremont, they're using the native frangipani as, that's what I like, um, as a street tree in the median strips because they're sort of straight up. Straight up. Yeah. So power lines, so you, you, the banksia, the coral gum, the dwarf sugar gum. Now the Carimbia physifolia, there are, there's about seven different ones that maximum five metres. They're a grafted form. Um, yeah, so none of those would be any good. Uh, the almond might be all right. Yes. i tell you what's a ripper is um, eucalyptus todtiana. You can put that under a power line. And that's a, they're very slow growing, but that's part of your succession planning. Mm -hmm. So you'd put them in knowing that in 10 years' time you're actually going to get a canopy because they will live for minimum 200 years. So they're a very long-lived eucalypt. Um, and Todd Tiana is a beautiful tree, absolutely glorious. 
and the cockatoos love them as well because they've got quite good sized nuts on them. There's a lot of the list I've give, given, there's a lot of the smaller eucalypts um, that are suitable for under power lines. And of course there's Mediterranean, the plants of the Mediterranean are also suitable to our climate. But I think what councils need to do is create a sense of neighbourhood. So even if you're renting a place, that, you know, if the council provides a tree, then they do it sort of street, either block by block and say, and just have a community barbecue and say, we've got, we're going to plant 30 trees in your neighbourhood. This is the tree. This is what it looks like. We would love you to be involved with that tree becoming your neighbourhood tree for the next generations. Because I don't think there's, enough, not, there's not enough emphasis in... It's not... The council aren't putting a tree in there for you. They're putting it in there for generations to come. And we forget that. So because we now live in an age where everything's instant, where politicians are really only interested in sort of what happens in the next four years, we've forgotten that we need to actually leave this planet in a better state than what we found it in. And we're certainly not doing that at the moment. But some of my, you know, some of my gardening books that my nan had, because I collect really old gardening books, it actually says, we have, we have bought into this garden and we want the soil to be better for our children than what it is now. So their whole thing was about doing it for future generations, not for, you know, I'm here, I don't like that tree, I don't give a damn, I hope it bloody well dies. Because that tree is there for all the kids that will become adults later on in life, hopefully. The, the idea is, is to give people a costing. You know, if you put two buckets of water on your tree for once a week for the summer period, it's only going to cost you this much. The other thing that happens is now councils have to get independent arboriculturalists to do a, a report on trees because if they don't get independent people, the general public say, oh, you've just made that up. So if someone's taken a sample of the tree and decided that uh, it's got a disease and it's only got X amount of time to live, then they, you know, it may even be that, that a report's been written to say that those trees are dying and you need to get rid of the dead bits, I'm not sure. Because some of the developments around where I live, particularly the units, apartments, luxury, apartments, uh, they don't have a single tree anyway, in fact not a piece of green anything, they have put false lawn, plastic grass on the entire verge. Um, just one other thing uh, that's really interesting to think about is um, genetic diversity within plant species. So what happened, we'll, we'll wrap it up pretty soon, because um, I think the people that work here want to, well, all, all the City of Melville people probably, they've been at work since 6.30 this morning, um, as have I. I? <laughs> um, <laughs> what they're looking at now is, um, particularly in street tree planting in Europe, what they've found that we, when they used grafted trees or the trees were, were taken all from one stock, the genetic diversity wasn't there. So when one tree got a disease, every single tree got it. So now we're looking at getting trees from seed rather than grafted forms because they're less susceptible to actually wiping out the entire stock of plants. And you will get, as you know with jacarandas, you will get that diversity. So. On the, on the avenues of jacarandas, you'll see some trees that ha hardly flower at all, others flower magnificently, they'll all be different shapes. But that is a good thing, because it's like monocropping. 
you know, when you get a, a disease in a monocrop, it'll take out the entire crop. So we need to think about not just about biodiversity and diversity of species, but genetic diversity. As we know with, you know, plants that are endangered in, in areas where there's only a few plants, that there is not enough genetic diversity for that plant to actually survive. So um, I'd like to thank the guys from Melville that came here tonight and actually organised this. Um, and they were genuinely interested in all your feedback um, so that they can take note of those and try and improve the service that they're giving and make people feel that they do have some say into the selection of their trees and things. So thank you guys. <laughs> and, um, and it's been great to meet you all and fabulous to see that there's, we've got everyone seemed to be here that love trees rather than, than not, which is wonderful. And thank you to Sabrina, please. Yeah. <laughs>